Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea from SciFlourish. Today, we are going to dive deep into the final chapter of Empire of the Ghouls, but more so I'm going to talk about how I took this chapter and blew it out into almost a mini campaign, and that is running the city of Vandekul in the adventure Empire of the Ghouls. I have been playing Empire of the Ghouls now for more than a year, like about a year and a half. And I love this campaign. It's been really, really, really fun. I love this adventure. I love the campaign that we've been running there. My players have been loving it. It's really been an epic, fun campaign set in Midgard. And I highly recommend Empire of the Ghouls. I highly recommend Midgard. You can find a link where I talk uh, in depth about Empire of the Ghouls overall and offer my tips for running it. But I wanted to focus today on just running the city of Vandekul. Vandekul is the city, the, the, the white city it is called. It is the city of Ghoul, the of Ghoul city where the climax of the adventure takes place. But I've really taken this and expanded it out in a lot of ways. And I wanted to talk about what it's been like to expand it out and how you can use that to generally run other kinds of big evil cities. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of awesome exclusive features, a dedicated Discord server, the monthly Q&A, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, tons of stuff that you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. So please consider becoming a patron. It helps me put on shows like this. And you get lots and lots of awesome tools, tips, tricks, adventures, and resources to help you run your games as long as well as a big connection to the rest of the lazy dm community to the patrons of Sly, Sly flourish thank you so much for your outstanding support so if i had one thing one lesson that i wanted to provide one experience that i wanted to share about running vandekul but also I'm, i i don't want this to just be a talk about running vandekul from empire of the ghouls because not everybody's going to run it not everybody that's going to run is going to end up getting to this one spot but i want to talk about like running an evil city like running a dark city i i don't think that it's very common to do so but it could definitely be there and even if you have a city that went dark like baldur's gate in murder at baldur's gate is a pretty dark city there's there's lot you know lots of times where even cities that were kind of normal turned bad and are dangerous and what is it like to run a campaign there so a lot of the tips and tricks and things that i'm going to talk about in this video i think you can apply to lots of sort of you know, dark cities, evil cities, cities where, you know, dangerous cities, cities where the rulers are not in the benefit of the people uh, or the people are not in the benefit of the rest of humanity. So I think that there are lessons from this that we can apply to lots of different kinds of uh, fantasy RPGs, lots of fantasy RPG settings that take place in sort of these dark and evil cities. So my number one lesson from this I was, I was thinking before the show like what's the main thing that i recommend the main thing i recommend is that you build out a city with a lot of factions that are sort of fighting against one another in sort of a cold war and the characters can get involved in these cold war factions and they can betray anybody and they totally feel fine with it that is an advantage of running in an evil city that for them from the player perspective is you can screw people over and not feel bad about it Right. That there isn't there's no good people here. Like one of the nice things about Vandekul is I had like, I don't know, eight or nine different factions that were kind of at each other's throats. But sometimes it was just Cold War stuff like they weren't directly fighting each other, but they were definitely vying for power over one another. They were definitely doing subtle stuff. And because it's evil, they're doing like assassination attempts and they're doing poisonings and they're doing like propaganda campaigns and they're doing all kinds of stuff against one another. And the players can get involved in that all that they want. And even if they're like on the side of one group and then betray that person, they can be totally good and do that because everybody's bad, right? Everybody in the city's bad. So there's definitely an advantage to having a city where everybody's bad because you don't feel bad about betraying anybody. It's the one opportunity you have to betray anyone at any time for any reason and have it work out. And that has happened in my Vandekul section of running Empire of the Ghouls. And I've enjoyed it a lot. My players have enjoyed it a lot. And I think it's a really big advantage. So consider like build out your living city, have lots of different factions that are vying for power against one another that are doing kind of subtle stuff. And the players can get involved in this big thick web and they can change their minds all the time they can go from just getting ready to poison somebody to one second later switching over and and allying with that person and and claiming that the poison came from somebody else it's it's this great kind of great kind of thing 
So that's the main thing. So so and and I when I when I started running Vandekool, I knew that that was something I wanted to do. I I I knew that in the earlier parts of that section of Empire of the Ghouls, they were going through lots of the the underworld tunnels. They were meeting Darrow. They were seeing like the processing grounds for for humanoids for ghouls. They all these kind of different places, and it was very much sort of an underground sort of a vault of the drow kind of big underworld exploration of of underground tunnels and stuff like that old graveyards and crypts and tunnels of monsters and then they and they got involved in stuff and they went across the big crazy sulfurous the sulfurous sea had some adventures on an island over there and then the minute they sort of land in vandacool it changed completely and now it's all city political intrigue so it went from like adventures underground in deep and fighting weird monsters that have lived underground for all this time to hey there's 12 factions Here's all the different interconnections of all these factions. Here are all the people you have to worry about. Here's what, who's going against who. Here's who's allied with who. And the players are like, I thought we were like in a big underground cave. And then suddenly there's this like crazy yarn and tack map of all of the different interconnections. I liked that idea. I like the idea that there's like, you know, within this city, deep underground, deep under the, under the earth, there's this like crazy political factions going on. And the model that I use for this, and I actually think this gets into when we talk about adventure types, I've lately been publishing a lot of articles to Sly Flourish about types of adventures, the sort of adventure models that you can use for running adventures. I did this in the Lazy DMs Companion. It has a bunch of adventure models and how you can fill out those adventure models. And one of the models that I actually, I use in Ruins of the Grendel Root, but I don't think I describe in either this as, as a core adventure model or in the Lazy DMs Companion, is the Fistful of Dollars model. Now, sometimes, this is an interesting thing about using movies as, or movie storylines as plots of adventures. GMs do it all the time. But there are some good ones and there are some bad ones. And it's hard, the, the way you can tell a good movie plot line for a D&D adventure or an RPG adventure from a bad one is how much agency do the characters have to affect the outcome of the story? And a lot of movies are procedural. The, 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 they have to go the direction that they went. The characters have to go the way that they're going for the movie to make sense at all, for the movie to work. And those do not work well for for, for fantasy RPGs. But then there are some where they're very situational. There's a situation going on, the characters are dropped into the situation, and they have to figure out how to navigate it. And those movie storylines work very well. One that I bring up all the time, it's interesting that Akira Kurosawa is the creator of both of these, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, and, and the Magnificent Seven is the Western version of this, is a really good example of an adventure model that works well for D&D because it's like, you know, a, a bunch of farmers recruit the characters to protect their village from a bunch of bandits. The characters get to decide how they're going to defend the village. They decide if they're going to go and attack the bandits ahead of time. They get to choose how to train the farmers or what kind of defenses to build. It's a very open-ended adventure where you have a situation, the characters are recruited, they they decide how to defend the place, and then you get to run it. That works really well. Akira Kurosawa had two other movies, Sanjiro, Yojimbo, and, and Sanjiro. We're going to focus on Yojimbo. Although I think Yojimbo and Sanjiro have very similar storylines. But Yojimbo is about a uh, samurai, a ronin, who goes into a town, and the town is being crushed between two rival gangs. And our hero, Sanjiro, decides to bounce back and forth between the two different gangs kind of double crossing them over one another with the added he's a mercenary so he's not super like a great guy but the reality is he's benefiting the people who are in the city who are being crushed between these two gangs so the fistful of dollars dollars model works actually really well as a as a fantasy rpg as a as a dnd or 5e adventure because you can set up a situation where you have a town or you have a, an area and you have two rival gangs that are fighting you might have another gang that or another group that's sort of stuck between these two and you don't like either gang but the characters can decide which one do we want to join do we want to betray one over the other do we want to fight them both and i have actually a an adventure in ruins of the grand Ru called fistful of copper which is based on this exact idea you have hobgoblins and orcs that are both working against one another but they both if they happen to be working together both of them would try to attack deep delver's enclave so you get to decide how you're going to work on one over the other there's lots of different options to do it so it's a pretty interesting adventure but what if you took fistful of dollars but instead of having two gangs it's like nine gangs and that's what I wanted to do for, for Vandekool is have Vandekool set up where you had a whole pile of different 
villains that you're facing. There's a whole different group. So you have multiple. And one of the things about the Empire of the Ghouls is that it's very hierarchical. The Ghoul Imperium is very hierarchical. They have dukes and duchesses and marquises and marquesses and barons and baronesses and stuff like that. They have these like royalty, like ghoul royalty on top of like military ranks as well. So you have lots of options of like people who are trying to climb the political ladder that are working against one another. And it worked extremely well when I did it. So like right when the characters arrived on shore, one group immediately said, I know who you guys are and I'm going to help you out because we actually don't like the emperor, nor do we like the Duke. And it, we can help you get, you know, we'll get you situated so that you can work it out. And the player's like, okay, but then, you know, and they said, you know, if you want to, you could talk back to, you know, talk to this group. But then the characters immediately got involved in like a love triangle between the Duke and a baroness, Marques Dorva Graysuture, who used to be connected to the Duke, like used to be the, the Duke's consort. But then, the, in, in, and she is no longer the Duke's consort. And I think I added a baroness who was the new Duke's consort. And so the Marques recruited the characters to assassinate the Baroness. So when the characters first were going to go meet Marques Dorvik Graysuture, they poisoned her wine with an with a ghoul poison that they were about to pour in and, and, and give to her. And then like on the way, they heard her talking about her job and like, hey, I'd love, you know, that the Baroness is actually in the Duke's estate and I will, I will help you dethrone the Duke because I'm so mad at him. If he's dethroned and sort of humbled, then he'll love me again, was her, was her feelings. That if, if, if I ruin his plans, he will love me again. And then he'll recognize that he should have stayed with me all this time. And so she uh, says, I, in order to, for him to love me again by having his plans thwarted, I need you to go kill the Baroness. So, and the Baroness is in his estate, a place called White Mark. I want you to infiltrate his estate and go to and kill the Baroness. And then she's like, why don't we all drink to it? And she pours out the poison wine and the characters are like, we don't want to poison her anymore. We think we're going to work for her. So they like slap the poison wine out of her hand and it splashes another ghoul who melts like one of the like tote in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then they go like, oh, clearly the Baroness was trying to assassinate you. And she's like, oh, it's even more important that we go and kill her. And the characters were like seconds away from killing her. So they decide, yeah, okay, we'll, 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 we'll follow her along and we'll do her thing and we'll go kill the Baroness. So then they went and they killed the Baroness and that worked out. They, they, and then like the Baroness was like, oh, you guys were sent by that, that old hag, Dorva Graysuture. Why don't you work for me instead? And they're like, yeah, we could, nah. And they just killed her. <laughs> right? So they had these like choices of like who they're going to work for, who are they, who are they not going to work for? And they would actually, in some cases, have groups work against one another. So there was a faction that I added, which was, a high a, a vampire high priestess to the red mother who had an basically like a church and an embassy in Vandacool. I added I added this in. And because of the trials that occurred earlier in Empire of the Ghouls where the characters broke up a symbolic wedding between the ghouls and the vampires, there was a lot of tension between the ghouls and the vampires. And so the characters pretended to be, and they decided this all on their own, that I didn't I didn't railroad them this way at all. They just said, you know, one thing we could do, they said the problem is we look like us and lots of people know who we are because we were the ones that screwed up that red that 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 blood marriage. So we know that people know what if we pretended to be theatrical players who were pretending to be those characters to put on shows about what the blood marriage was like and that meant the ghouls thought they were really funny because the ghouls weren't really into the blood marriage anyway for them it was largely like an, a, a symbolic alliance but they aren't very superstitious about it but the vampires were superstitious the vampires also lost a number of high powerful vampires during that thing so the vampires were really mad which meant they could add tension between the ghouls and the vampires by putting on these stage shows about th what the blood marriage was like, which is ironic because they actually were the ones that, that did it. So then they worked that group. I, I decided like even, I wanted to add even more factions. So even though there's a bunch of factions that in the book are already there, I wanted more. So I added, I added the vampire high priestess as an example because I wanted to tie back to the, what the characters had done many, many months ago for the, for the blood marriage. But also I, I was like, you know what? I want, a, I want a Nihilith. I want an undead Abolith who exists down here, way down deep in the sewers. 
and the you know who wants all of the ghouls removed so that that the abolith can rule the undead abolith can rule over the whole area with their thralls instead so i named him ix yes i named it directly after the planet ix from dune because i was watching a lot of dune at the time reading a lot of dune at the time and so we have this undead nihilith called ix who also recruited the characters and they joined him for a little while and one of the characters let him manipulate their brain and stuff like that. And then they came out and Ix was giving them quests as well. There's also the the Beggar King was another who wanted to kind of, you know, basically said, we don't want the city. They're, they're kind of like a power to the people sort of ghoul. Hey, we just want ghouls. Ghouls are just meant to eat. They're not meant to be in these hierarchical chains. So we just want all of the ghoul. We want the we want to shatter the Imperium here in Vandacool so that the city could just be a city of ghouls again. We could just get, get back to being ghouls. We don't we don't want to have to go up top. We don't want to be in big armies and all that stuff. So maybe if you are able to disrupt the Duke's plan, but also manage to get the Emperor out, that would be great too. All of these different factions, all of them who have different motivations and goals, all of them willing to betray one another, and the characters can change their mind about all of them as they go. And bouncing around between all of these factions, allying with some, breaking alliances with others, just outright killing others, was a really fun way for the characters to navigate this whole city of Vandacool in a really big sandboxy way that let the players have tons of agency over what they wanted to do, who they wanted to do it to, which groups they wanted to ally with, which ones they wanted to just kill which ones they wanted to ally with and then break alliances with which ones they wanted to betray and everything like that and and then a big part of it was letting the letting things escalate in the city as they were doing things so for example once they killed the vampire high priestess of the the, the temple of the red mother a bunch of vampires escaped and now they're going there they don't have anything binding them back so they're running around the city they're killing ghouls they're killing mortals they're killing anybody that they can in the city that started to go then when they went to gray spire which is like a citadel in the center and their job there was to to work on stuff there was an artifact so this was something i added actually we'll we'll, we'll get to the, we'll get to this one of the things that I wanted to be careful of is the characters are pretty high level and it's a pretty high level area, which means if if the ghouls had access to teleportation and scrying, this whole place would be very different than it would be otherwise. So one of the things I added was this idea that there is an artifact in the city called the weave bender and the weave bender prevents all scrying and all teleportation within a few miles of the city, which means that nobody can just like teleport in and assassinate somebody and teleport out again. Cause otherwise like the chaos of the city would be too great. If, if even if, if Dorva Graysuture could be spying upon her Duke or whatever, she'd have too much information that would make the city not as much fun. So one of the ideas I had was that like all of them agreed to have this artifact in place, which was kept by a bunch of conscripted um, uh, ghoul knights in Grayspire, this keep in the center. And it's actually down in the cellars of the keep is this artifact called the weave bender. And the weave bender prevented scrying and teleportation, which of course limited the character's options for scrying and teleportation, which was kind of the goal, but also limited anybody else's scrying and teleportation. And it also prevented Ix, this Abolith mind flayer, or Abolith, uh, undead Abolith, from controlling the city too much already because he could, his telepathic abilities were limited by the Weavebender as well. He could kind of pierce through a little bit. He could like send little messages, but he couldn't really control anybody. He couldn't send out, couldn't, couldn't send out ghouls in mass. So one of the things the characters had to do was go disrupt the Weavebender. That was one of the things they didn't have to, but they were recruited by Ix to do so. So they said, sure, we'll do that for Ix. Also, it sounds cool. And it sounds like it'd be better for us if this thing was gone. So the characters went and infiltrated Grayspire Keep. They went down into the cellars. They found the Weavebender and they broke it. Well, as soon as they do, now scrying and teleportation works, which means now the ghouls can scry and teleport upon each other. And that's crazy too. They're zipping around. They're doing stuff. So they got to a point where like the, the there's an escalation in the city that is growing. The tensions in the city are going from what was a cold war to a hot war where now ghouls are fighting ghouls ghouls are fighting vampires ghouls and vampires are going after mortals things are just going very high in chaos now the whole reason the characters are here is because duke moretto lichmark and his high priest are conducting a foul ritual to create these on uh, dark these intelligent ghoul knights that they want to use to do a civil war against the emperor 
So they're still working on that. And that's been largely isolated from all of the other stuff that's been going on in the city. The characters know they need to get there. They didn't know how to get there. They knew they couldn't go walk right in the front door because there's like an entire legion of ghouls that are guarding the outside. But they're like, we need to find a way in. And they heard, well, some people know of some ways, but they have to like conduct some of these jobs and ally with somebody in order to figure out uh, how to get in. But lots of different people knew it. So like three or four different NPCs could have known how to get into the Bone Cathedral, the final area. And it was up to the characters to decide who do they want to get that information from. And then, of course, they could betray them. So because we don't care about the betrayal. So that worked really well. So that dancing around kind of working different factions off one another, lying to people, stealing from them, murdering them, betraying them. All of that, it's like having a group that can do evil stuff, but it's not evil because the whole city is evil. So you can have like all of the fun of a game where you have evil characters that are doing all of these lying, cheating, betrayals, and steals, but they're not because, they, you know, if they could nuke the whole town, the whole world would be better off because the town is filled with ghouls and ghouls are all jerks. So that was a really kind of fun thing. One of the things that I considered with this is I had sort of my, you know, session zero for the game. We had safety tools and there were things that I didn't really want to do. And one of the things is like, I didn't really want to shine too bright a light on the whole idea of like harvesting mortals as food for an entire city. That is so gruesome to me that I was like, it, it's definitely happening. But like, I brought it up and I said like down here and I had, I had the ghouls tell them this, like, but that's the, that's the processing here. Don't go there. Like, you don't want to know what goes on there. I don't want to know what goes on there. Don't go into those buildings. And so we just... I kept it like I, it's like hard veil, right? It wasn't quite a hard line, but it was a deep veil where it's like, we're just never going to go into that place because the, the, the ideas of a ghoul city and how a ghoul city stays fed is so repellent to me as a human being that I didn't really want to focus and shine too bright a light on it. The adventure does shine a, a light on it. I don't need it and I don't really want it. And I didn't really want to go that way in general. It, uh, there, were, there were whole areas about like the enslaving of of mortals and then yeah it was just i didn't want to i didn't want to go there so i hung on tightly to my safety tools i made sure it was clear to my players we're just going to talk about the ghouls we're not going to talk you know we'll mention the fact that like there's food and there were gladiator fights where they actually met some good npcs that were like good people in the town and that was important like hey we also want to have some friends here that are good people that you want to rescue that can help you but i but i definitely stayed to my safety tools and i think if you're going to run a place or run an evil city knowing what those boundaries are for the players and recognizing knowing what the boundaries are for you because i have my boundaries or things just i don't want to do the boundaries for the players of like okay we don't want the players to go into these areas as well and you don't the players don't want me to go in there for where the game is going and then recognizing that those can change right that like as we get deeper in the story there may be things where we touch on things like oh i didn't really bring that up during the session zero but i know i don't want to do it let's stop let's pause for a minute just to let you know i'm going to draw a hard line on x so we're not going to you know we're not going to talk about x because it's too gruesome and weird and i don't like it and we're just gonna, not going to do it and it's okay great and then we backed away you can know what's happening but we're not going to touch on it so hang on to your safety tools and remember that your safety tools can evolve as you're running a game that you may hit parts of the game where it's like wow how do you talk about a ghoul city without talking about how they eat you can you can just not talk about it you can just say yeah they eat and then we don't talk about how Right. That works. That works well. Now, part of that is also like a fun thing about running a city like Vandekool is that you have dials on the safety of the city. And this is true for like any hostile city, any city where like things aren't going well, that there isn't a, a law that is there to protect the people. And in our case, one of the things and it's actually in the adventure that the characters can sort of remove. I think it's in the adventure that. I, I might have added this, that they can, there, there, there's a part of the adventure where essentially the characters can remove their own souls. And by removing their souls and storing them somewhere else, they kind of can't be detected as being good mortals. Like they look like they're not quite undead. They're just the hollow mortals and the ghouls aren't going to really bother them, right? The ghouls are like, yeah, you know, we don't really care. If they walked in souls burning bright, the ghouls might just immediately attack them. So one of the things they had to do was, was put their souls somewhere else. In their case, they put it into a branch of the world tree that they picked up in the north. So they, they planted a branch, it started to grow, and there was this branch of the world tree and they, they you know, conducted a ritual 
took their souls out, which are like little spheres, put them inside the tree, and then the tree grew, and they knew that their souls are stored in the tree. They can go back and get them later. But I did have a thing of like, you know, the longer you are removed from your soul, the more undead like you become. The more, the the harder it will be to, for you to reconnect to your soul, and you'll be lost. So that was kind of a fun dial that I put on there. But it meant the whole purpose of this was I wanted the characters to have the option to walk around the city and not immediately have nine thousand ghouls attacking them. On the other hand, I didn't want to have zero ghouls attacking them. So what you can do is kind of dial in the level of safety. You can say like, you know, I, I as a GM could say there might be times where I could roll random encounters where there would be ghouls that are like, we don't care that you're soulless. We still want to eat you. Right. And so they could get attacked by ghouls or they could have people that recognize them. I think at one point they were recognized by one of the ghouls who was at the, the blood marriage and managed to survive the blood marriage. And they knew who they were. So you can kind of dial in the difficulty, which means that if you want to throw some combat encounters while they're wandering around the city, you can. If you also want them to wander around the city and not get attacked, you can. So there's really nice advantages in, in kind of deciding what the dial is for their safety as they're crossing the city. Will they get recognized? Will they you know, run into people they know? Will assassins try to... Is there a group... In, in my game, I had a group of assassins that were trying to hunt them down. And I could always just have those assassins show up or have scouts of the assassins show up or whatever. So there's nice ways to kind of have it make sense that they could cross the city without getting attacked. But also, if I wanted to, or if the, the dice would turn in that favor, if I decided that the beats were right, that they could get attacked in the city. So there was some nice dials for in-world in safety as they were crossing the city. Then I would also say, if you want to cross, a, a big concern was, will we be recognized? Like, we are we are notable heroes at this point. And as we do more stuff inside Vandekool, will, be, will we be recognized as being both who we are outside of Vandekul, but now as the people that are causing trouble inside of Vandekul. So that meant they didn't always want to walk just openly on the city streets and they might want to go down deep. And that's where I was like, okay, well, like every good city, and I think this is almost always true. It's always nice, almost always nice for any decent sized town to have some kind of tunnels or chambers or wellways or underground rivers or sewers or whatever that lie beneath and that way the characters have a different way to get from point a to point b in the city and it's also a nice place that if they're like we don't want to be recognized or we want to go on adventures or the sewers are connected to other places that we want to go to that they can always travel through the sewers they can always find their way and you have this new sort of dungeon that is right underneath their feet and I, I have been doing this in like every game that I have has some kind of sewers beneath it. And what's really funny is I was thinking about this today about, I think it was like 12 or 13 years ago. I ran an adventure called murder at Baldur's gate. It was one of the Baldur's gate adventures before fifth edition. So it was during the D and D next time. And the whole thing was like, you know, a hundred years after the events of Baldur's gate two. And it actually tied in with, with Baldur's gate one and two, the video games quite a bit. And I remember playing the adventure, picking up the adventure, reading through the adventure. And I was like, there's no dungeon in here. It's all just going to places and talking to people. There's no actual crawling a dungeon. I was like, I remember doing lots of dungeons when I was playing Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Isn't there like a whole temple to ball under there? Like, where are these places? And I remember that was the first time. I don't know if it was like the first time, but I was so used to kind of having adventures handhold me and give me the dungeons that I needed that I would, that I, I realized I need to add my own dungeon. And in that case, like, I didn't really understand how you add dungeons to things 15 years ago. And I, so, but I did, I kind of made my own dungeons. I said, oh yeah, there's these places called the undersellers. They even call them in that in Baldur's Gate, that there's the undersellers and the undersellers are like the connected sellers of lots of buildings. And I was like, ooh, I could do that. But looking back on it, I don't think it was a very interesting adventure. I don't think it was a very interesting dungeon. The Vandekool also does not have a dungeon underneath it in the book as written. But in mine, there are many, many dungeons beneath Vandekool. And I've run many, many dungeons as part of the adventures. They definitely have a super big sewer system that exists beneath Vandekool. And the sewer system is connected to some natural caves that have been there for a long time. And that's where you have creatures like Ix. And you have other creatures that are down there. And you have sections where the sewers have collapsed into natural tunnels. And you can have all kinds of monsters. And there's a cool, the lowest level of ghoul is down there. But also there are other creatures that lurk down in the sewers. Can imagine how bad the monsters can be in the sewers of a city of ghouls. Lots of fun there. And there were many times that the characters went down to the sewers in order to kind of go from point A to point B without anybody knowing that they were going there. And it was lots of room for adventure. And of course, the way that I added 
those sewers was by grabbing maps from Dyson logos. So back 15 years ago, I didn't have access to uh, Dyson maps, but now I do. And this means that I can go and decide to add a dungeon pretty much anywhere if the characters are going to try to sneak into White Mark the um, uh, Duke Moretto Lichmark's private residence, but they want to do so by going through some old catacombs that exist beneath White Mark. And I come up with a whole story about how there's like, you know, weird catacombs that exist there that might, he might not even know about secret entrances that he might not know about, but maybe Dorva Graysuture did know about them because she read some old lore. I can grab any one of the maps that I think fits that particular dungeon style and run with it and go. And I did this all over Vandekul. I must have 10 or 12 different Dyson maps that I used to add dungeons to various places. You can, of course, get maps from Dyson Logos at dysonlogos.blog slash maps. It is linked in the show notes. I also, patrons of Sly Flourish, have access to a uh, special tool that I wrote. Patrons of Sly Flourish have access to the Dyson Commercially Licensable Map Gallery. This is a gallery that I put together from all of the maps that Dyson has released under with, a, with, a, with an open royalty license. And I wanted one where I could just very quickly see thumbnails of various places, quickly look, find one, right click on it and have just the map without having to go through a bunch of HTML pages. So, and I have a little slider here so that it fits. It works well on mobile. It works well on desktop devices. And when you find a map that you like, you can click it and it goes straight to a copy of that map, which you can use in your virtual tabletop of choice, or you can print out and draw your own things on there. But you get to find the right map that, that suits the dungeon that you need all from within this one tool. So that is available to patrons of Sly Flourish. It's one of the many tools, including a monster database, Forge of Foes stat generator, the lazy GM's random generator, lots of different tools. This is an example of one of the tools that you can get being a patron of Sly Flourish. And special thanks to Dyson, of course, for making all of these maps available under his royalty-free license. That is extremely huge, huge benefit to creators like me. Also a huge benefit to GM's who want to fill in all of those, add dungeons anywhere that they need to in whatever campaign they happen to be running. Even though there's a nice benefit to having an evil city where the characters can manipulate and betray and murder and do all kinds of stuff, assassinate political factions and cause strife and not feel bad about anybody because everybody's a jerk. The other problem with it is everyone's a jerk and the city is really dark and grim and there, there's like not a lot of nice people here. And that is one giant downward beat. That there's never a time where the characters can just kind of relax and meet people that they like and have interactions with what's going on. So it's important to add some stuff like that. And one of them is like having a nice safe place to be able to have a rest and get away from it. And actually having the idea that the character's souls were stored in a branch of the world tree and that they could sort of imagine the internal workings of the world tree as sort of like a condominium that they could go into in their minds and relax and have a rest there. That was one thing that I added where like I was like, look, you know that sometimes you will need to go back to you, you'll have to find a safe place for your bodies to physically rest. But while you're resting there, your minds can go back to the world tree. And then I could have each of the players describe like what is their little chamber in the world tree like that they have set aside so that they could rest there and be near their own souls and be near the life of the world tree and be away from Vandekul for a little while. And they each kind of described what their location was like and who else might be there and other people that they could see. And there was other people that were in the world tree, but other sort of spiritual entities that they had met throughout the campaign that, that existed existed in the world tree that worked out really well and it gave them the option that while they were resting they didn't have to be in this like crappy vandicool place the whole time that they could have a nice place but then later in the adventure the car one of the characters actually turned a monument i had like an evil crystalline growth that grew out of the thing that was you know radiating necrotic energy and one of the characters burned a heavy spell to kind of turn it around into a radiant crystal and then said, and I, you know, after the battle was over, said, I want to make that permanent. And so they spent the time and energy of making, taking a long rest and making the crystal permanent. And then more crystals started to grow. And I was like, you've now created this sort of radiant sphere that's growing in the heart of Vandekul. It's underneath the ground. It's down in these old chambers that nobody's been to. But now there's this 
radiating growth and even like Ix, then the nihilist couldn't see it he didn't he did, couldn't see that he's like there's a hole in the world that i can't see into and i can't and for the character who was manipulated by Ix, that character in there could not have their minds read they could not you know they gave them a sanctuary in the middle of vandacool and that meant when they rescued people and they did they rescued like some a bear folk gladiator that they rescued they rescued a couple of valkyries that were at the island offshore they rescued the valkyries and the valkyries they then used the valkyries but the valkyries in spiritual form stayed there and guarded this particular area which meant they had this little sanctuary down underneath the city that the ghouls wouldn't ever want to go to like the ghouls didn't even know it was there but they sure knew not to go there right it's like they could they just were repelled by it like they were physically repelled by it which meant that the characters had this place that if they could make their way back there they had a safe place to rest they knew it was safe they had friends around there that they knew they, they trusted they had a place where they could send refugees so if they found other mortals that they wanted to save from the ghouls while all this is going on they could send the mortals down there and the mortals could totally go there and be safe and that worked well too they also have a ship that's possessed by a ghost who is a former hero of one of the characters and that ship is offshore so they could also send send refugees off of the ship but basically we had these little islands of good things happening little islands of nice places that the players would want to go later like that the players would want their characters to go to so that the players could relax a little bit because when you're just dealing with evil stuff all the time you need a break and just having being able to say with our words that they could go to this place and they knew it was safe and they knew ghouls wouldn't attack them there and their friends were there and they could rest and not be mind read and and get everything that they needed together so that they could go back out into the city of ghouls and deal with what they're doing that was really nice and helpful to them it, it, I, I know that the players enjoyed it they liked being able to build it themselves they liked that they created it and, you know, because now they know they've had this effect on the world. What's interesting is like they were still trying to ally with Ix, but Ix was like, what is this thing you've done to my city? Like, that's permanent. That's never going to go away. Even if the ghouls are all dead, there's still this growing thing. And they're like, yeah, tough. Like, sucks to be a, sucks to be a nihilist, man. You're going to this is going to grow and it's eventually going to push you out. So that was kind of interesting. And like what the issue was of, of, of you know, those who allied with Ix versus those who created this thing but then eventually that got worked out and like yeah we hate it so that's gonna be the only but that like when you're running a dark adventure i think this is pretty much true anytime you're running any kind of dark adventure make sure to focus on having a couple of good places that the characters can go where the characters and the players can go and relax and get away from the super dark stuff that's going on and all the rest of the adventure that worked really well. So on top of having a nice place to rest is having nice people to talk to. So other than just, I, I mentioned that like all of the factions are being run by a bunch of ghoul, ghoul jerks or vampire jerks or other kinds of jerks. So you don't mind betraying them, but you do want the characters to meet nice people too. And you can do this very well by looking at the characters and saying, I'm going to make an NPC that's connected to one of the characters that they might run into. That might be a prisoner of the ghouls, might be a gladiator of the ghouls, might be like, in one case, there was a Minotaur blackguard that they fought who had been a form was a ghoul minotaur blackguard really powerful that was a former hero known by one of the characters and when she was killed her in essence went into her sword and made this powerful sword but the essence was the essence of the original hero so now the character has a great sword that has the essence of the hero that they rescued whose soul they had rescued from the, the the ghoul minotaur blackguard that they fought so now they have like an npc that's a hero of one of the characters that's inside a magic item that they can carry around but in another case they actually have people that they've met like a, a bear bear folk gladiator who was kind of a parallel to one of the characters in the game that they rescued and he fought his way he was they found him fighting a gladiator pit with a bunch of ghouls they got him rescued him and said hey we want you to go guard our crystalline place he's like absolutely i'll totally guard your crystalline place so he went and, and guarded that that place so you want to have npcs that the characters can meet and rescue or that aren't just jerks right and they're actually like they've managed to survive even being good people that the players can role play with and like instead of having a bunch of people they hate they still like some of the ghouls they're just like i'd kill you i like you but i'd st you're still a ghoul and i'd still totally kill you and then there's a lot about having like when i talk about adding dungeons everywhere there's this advantage of 
being able to put layers and layers and layers in the city as these dungeons. So you could have the sewers and you could say like the sewers are older than the empire is, but they were still built by constructed hands. But then there's tunnels beneath there that like, you know, other kinds of creatures had. And then, so one of the things I have is sort of a, a final dungeon. The characters are 13th level now, so they're pretty high level. And I wanted to sort of have like a final dungeon for them. And I said like for them to be able to get to the catacombs underneath the bone cathedral, which is sort of the final area, they had to cross through the worm ways and the worm ways are these huge worm tunnels that exist deep beneath Vandekul, beneath the sewers, beneath the ruins and beneath everything else that were there in the age of the primordials. And there are primordials who are still wandering around there, including one known as the Shogoth. The Shogoth is this alien entity. It's right out of Tome of Beast One. This alien entity that, that lurks around hunting for mortals in the worm ways. And there are ghouls who have made their way down there that became cultists of the, the like primordial cultists. And they have tattoos all over their skin. They don't eat anymore, so they're totally desiccated. And they just worship these huge primordials and these other creatures creatures that lurk down there that are completely alien to everything else so that way even though you have vandicool up above filled with ghouls and then you have the sewers which have ghouls and monsters and you have tunnels like where ix is and then you have these primordial wormways where you can say like hey what are all the aberrations from cr10 to cr20 let's throw them in there right and you get to hurl a bunch of really cool monsters in there so the characters have been making their way through there the only problem i had there is i did kind of railroad the characters to go face the shogoth and they're like is there any way around the shogoth i'm like you're pretty sure he's gonna hunt you no matter where you go and they're like they're like shoot you like i guess we're fighting the shogoth right so there's a little bit of that but they want to fight the shogoth in reality they want to fight the shogoth so those are some of my top tips i think for my experiences running vandicool i've really enjoyed it i think the idea of running an evil city where you have all of these different factions that are working against one another and the players can totally work with some ally with others betray others murder others do all this stuff is great especially when everybody's so bad you never feel bad about any of it that was kind of a fun and freeing thing it was, it was a, f a fun way to run an evil city and have characters that could do all of those kinds of things that they normally wouldn't do in any other city where they'd feel real bad about doing it for kings and queens. But when the kings and queens are eating folk, you really don't care. So that worked really well. I hope you found this video useful. If you did and you enjoyed what I've been talking about here and you want to see more stuff like this, please consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You get a weekly RPG-related email directly to your inbox along with a free Adventure Generator PDF. It's absolutely free to sign up. You can find the link for it in the show notes. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of cool stuff. Dedicated Discord servers, City of Arches Sourcebook, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, Monthly Q&A, the uh, Dyson map tool that I just showed, plus a bunch of other tools to help you build and prepare for your RPGs. And you can pick up any of my books, including Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, The Lazy DM Workbook, The Lazy DM's Companion, Forge of Foes, and all the fantastic adventure books on the Sly Flourish bookstore. Links to all of those things are in the show notes. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and get out there and play an RPG.